Good afternoon, and I hope you all had uh, a nice lunch. There's still a few people trickling back, but we're going to get started. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Sarah Nisbet to the stage. Sarah is a platforms manager at BioPlatforms Australia. Uh, she has a past background as a senior manager at a compute centre in South Australia. She's going to be able to talk to us today about supporting bioinformatics. I'm going to be talking as well, but I can't introduce myself because it seems a bit narcissistic. So I'm going to hand over to um, Sarah and then I'll come talk a little bit towards the end of her talk. Thank you, Mark, for that lovely introduction. Um, and. Thank you everyone for having me. It's really um, great to be here and presenting to you all. Um, and I think uh, I was really keen uh, to present today because I think what we're working on is um, of great interest and value uh, to the HPC uh, infrastructure community. And so um, I'm really keen to get the message out there about what we're doing and what we're working on and uh, invite you all to participate if you think you can um, if you see some value in it uh, for yourselves. Uh, so basically, as Mark said, uh, there's a lot of platforms in here. <laughs> I'm the uh, platforms and engagement manager for bio platforms. Um, so has everyone heard of bio platforms before? No? OK, so that's great. <laughs> basically, uh, we've been going for quite a while now. I've only been there uh, for a little under a year uh, we were established in 2007 and we're funded through something called the um, ANCRIS scheme and that's a <coughs> national collaborative research infrastructure program that funds um, research infrastructure for multiple different disciplines and domains um, and we just happen to exist to provide it uh, for life sciences. So we do exist to support researchers to do research by providing access to life science research infrastructure uh, the infrastructure that we uh, support falls into sort of four platforms. So genomics, proteomics, metabolomics and bioinformatics. And the talk today is primarily going to focus on the bioinformatics uh, investment that we're making. We have a core team of five staff, but we do support around about 17 different facilities um, around the country. And the reason I say approximately is because we're contracting with a few of them at the moment. And uh, there are a couple of little new ones coming on board um, for sort of new and innovative technologies. Um, what we do is provide capital support for instrumentation, so gene sequences, mass spectrometers and the like, um, and then operational support for the expertise to run uh, all of that. So this is a quick snapshot at our strategic plan and essentially there's a few things on here but what I really kind of want you to look at is those sort of three main pillars in the middle. There's the technology expertise which is those uh, platform investments that I mentioned earlier, the genomics, proteomics and metabolomics investments, um, our framework initiatives which I'll tell you a little bit about in a second and then our bioinformatics uh, investment is um, of an equal weighting of those other two traditional bioplatforms investments. So this is kind of what that our national footprint looks like. These are where our different <coughs> nodes are around the country. Uh, so we have a great uh, spread across uh, geographically. I can use this. All right, and then our framework strategy, probably the easiest way to describe this is that um, the framework strategy is creating open data initiatives um, through collaborative research projects which build critical omics data sets that support scientific challenges of national importance. So what we do is we have that um, infrastructure, we have those uh, instruments and what we do is for uh, research projects um, of national significance we will actually support time on that so that um, people can create uh, open reference data sets that um, anybody can access and they can access that through our data portal. <coughs> okay, so what is life sciences? Um, when I joined BioPlatforms I was at a uh, basically a HPC, state-based HPC provider and so you know a fair chunk of our users were bioinformaticians um, but I had no <laughs> moving over to bioplatforms where, where that's all we do, I was kind of shocked by the breadth and scale and size and complexity of what it is that um, 
of what's involved. Uh, you know, I was kind of thinking, oh, well, you know, the main applications we can think of are sort of, you know, curing cancer and that sort of thing. But um, really it is anything that's alive. Anything that's got a bit of DNA um, is within our remit to support. So that can be things like human health, so the cancer, disease, genetic stuff, uh, agriculture, crop and food sustainability, crop disease resistance, uh, and biodiversity, so environmental conservation, endangered species conservation, um, and microbes, which is a whole other area, um, large area. Um, so we estimate that there's about 30,000 uh, health or biosciences researchers in Australia, which represents a approximately 30% of the research effort, so that it's quite a large proportion of the community to support. And basically having a chat to the informatics um, unit at the University of Sydney, they're in a position where they have more data than they can analyse at the moment. So there really is this sort of data deluge. And there are a few, why is this happening? I guess there's a few sort of examples of why <laughs> we're in that position um, and there's these are just a few this is by no means a comprehensive list this is just some of the more ambitious uh, genomics programs that are kind of happening uh, around the world so locally here in Australia we're doing something called uh, 50 and 5 which is where Australian researchers plan to sequence 50 of Australia's most endangered animals over the next five years now this is our Australia's contribution to something called the Earth Biogenome Project, which is a global effort to sequence the genetic code or genomes of about 1.5 million known species on Earth. Um, there's another uh, health project um, in the UK where they're hoping to sequence 100,000 genomes um, by patients who are affected by rare disease or cancer. And then one that's already finished is that Cancer Ac Access, which is about um, sequencing 20,000 different types of cancer genomes. So you can imagine that these are just some of the larger flagship programs going on in the world that um, there's so many more and we're kind of in this uh, interesting moment where we've got a lot of data and a community that um, hasn't traditionally had the same sort of ongoing interaction with technology providers as say the physicists or the chemists. Um, so this slide is just kind of a little bit to give you an idea of the um, change that's happening within Australian life sciences, that there is sort of a workforce uh, transition here. Um, we've got 30,000 researchers to support and we've only got about 1,000 and even looking forward 1,500 bioinformaticians to support them. So how can we kind of uh, make sure that you know, we're doing world-class research when it's becoming increasingly computationally intensive but with a very limited um, bioinformatician cohort to support them. So I'll kind of speed through this, but essentially, historically, uh, BioPlatforms was interested in supporting a national consultation. This was run by Andrew Loney and his team um, and what happened over the course of a year. Um, there were some pretty, the key findings from that consultation have pretty much informed um, our current investment. But just quickly, so the broad challenges that emerged were the workforce, continuous reskilling, um, data retention, data curation, um, onshore use of large offshore sources of primary data. A lot of um, genomics resources end up in international databases and then kind of need to be brought back and forth. Um, and the complexity, I'll just move on. All right, so this kind of led the group to think that they might need something like an Australian biocommons. And, you know, the motivation for that is this data deluge, um, the bioinformatic technologies, uh, new forms of infrastructure are coming along. Um, and there's also these huge global investments um, that are driving a lot of um, international standards, um, technology standards, policy standards that um, would kind of be crazy not to align with and uh, recognise the value. But I guess one of the main things that we've kind of discovered, or not kind of discovered, have discovered and, um, and is informing what we do is that meeting this challenge for Australian life sciences um, is beyond the means of any single group uh, in Australia. It's just such a large, expensive 
task that really every, you know, as many partners as possible will need to come along to kind of help um, overcome some of these challenges. So, yes, so the answer is cooperation. Uh, as I said before, there's this kind of global wave of investment. These are billions of dollars that are being um, flowed through things like Elixir and the NIH and the Broad and all of these other um, international uh, organisations that we are seeking to partner and align with. Um, to get a better understanding of the international context, uh, Andrew Loney and his team uh, conducted a international study trip that sound, sounds kind of uh, exciting but also kind of hellish at the same time. They sort of just about visited everybody that, uh, that was relevant in, the, in Europe and the US. Um, and they, they kind of came back with a few conclusions. Um, and that was that global scale compute and data infrastructures are increasingly underpinning global scale research in life sciences. Uh, cloud first is pervasive across both the EU and the US, but they're just doing it in different ways. So in the US, um, true partnerships are really arising with cloud providers and people were kind of partnering in the true sense of the word with, um, with Google and Amazon. And I guess, you know, because the, they're US companies, they're not really having the same sort of data provenance issues as perhaps they might um, in the EU. And so they're kind of taking a different approach. Um, where Alexa is coordinating data infrastructure across Europe and they're sort of investing in their own um, federated compute and data uh, infrastructures. Okay. So we're in a really nice and unique opportunity in Australia at this moment. So NCRIS did extremely well um, in the last budget and it wasn't only, didn't only get um, funded, it got funded for 10 years, which kind of helps us with the year on year sustainability issue that we've been dealing with um, for the past sort of 10 years or more. So Bio Platforms and the other Anchors providers um, kind of have an opportunity to stop and think strategically and think, <coughs> okay, where, where do we want life sciences uh, to be sitting life sciences infrastructure to be sitting in the next five to ten years and how can we sort of help to support and underpin that. And so that's kind of led us into something called the Australian BioCommons. Um, so the BioCommons will comprise sort of three components, uh, a hub, a services layer and an underpinning cloud. Um, at the moment BioPlatforms is leading the investment into the leadership and services components, but um, if there's someone else in the community that wants to be involved in that leadership component, we're <coughs> very happy to um, include them. Um, we're looking to construct that BioCommons cloud with the, insist with the assistance of um, the appropriate, <laughs> not appropriately named, but the awkwardly named <laughs> DDERBs, uh, which are things like the AAF, RNET, ARDC, NCI, uh, PAUSI, and, um, and where possible if we can have hybrid cloud or um, burst capabilities with commercial providers. A few principles have emerged that we want the BioCommons um, to be informed by, and that is primarily number one, a national focus on capabilities and communities. We want to partner internationally uh, wherever possible to participate in and contribute to large critical mass efforts wherever possible, reuse and improve rather than build anew. Um, and I guess the other one that's kind of important to this group is just that second from the bottom one which is about promoting the development of um, a high throughput cloud infrastructure that's interoperable with the in international investments. The leadership, um, sorry to the leaders for <laughs> this horrible slide. Uh, so that's Andrew Loney at the top, uh, Rhys Francis, Stephen Manos and Jeff Christensen are kind of providing the leadership. There are a lot of other people involved. It was just a little bit hard to track down their photos. Um, the BioCommons is not something that is happening in isolation. Uh, at the moment, this is we are partnering with as many people as want to come and join the party and so at the moment we've got um, ARDC, NCI, Arnet and PAUSI all participating. Uh, our door is always open, we're very interested in how we can um, 
bring institutions into the fold, other research organisations. I guess the next, I think the next slide will show you where we are at, because um, this all probably sounds pretty fantastic, but the reality is something else. Um, those are the partners that are kind of in, um, participating in this first phase. So essentially where this BioCommons is at is those sort of those little pink boxes represent um, the consultations I told you about. The big yellow box represents the uh, vision for the BioCommons and this little red box is where we're at right now. So we're in a um, pretty early days. Um, we decided that before we made a really large investment that we should do a year of something that we've called pathfinding first um, and explore a couple of use cases to figure out um, what some of the um, key initiatives of the BioCommons should be. And so all of those partners at the moment are actually working in this pathfinder phase and we're working slowly transitioning into that BioCommons and having discussions about how we can all work together um, and make that happen. So there are sort of five technical activities or implementation studies. Implementation study is a nice word that we've borrowed from um, Elixir um, that are informing what might be some of the services or tools or capabilities uh, of the BioCommons that researchers can access. So number one is a human genome access and archive. Uh, number two is about interoperability with global data and so we're working um, with the NIH on their Kids First um, data sharing program to try and get the um, local kids cancer database uh, interoperable with the Kids First one over in the US. Uh, we're also working on a non-model genome assembly and annotation and I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail but probably not as much as I uh, intended uh, just because this one is particularly computationally intensive and this is the one where researchers at the moment are kind of having the most trouble with um, HPC providers uh, based on the feedback we've had. Um, and then the last one is something that's kind of actually up and running now and is a continuation of a previous uh, virtual lab which is um, a bring your own data capability which is essentially a, um, a Galaxy instance that anybody can kind of log in and use. And then underpinning that is the um, is that BioCloud which um, Mark's going to tell you a little bit more about. So de novo genome assembly is a process that needs to be undertaken for non-model uh, organisms because there's usually no prior knowledge of the source DNA sequence length, layer or composition of the particular species being examined. So if you sequence a human there's tons of reference set data sets out there that it's much easier and quicker to sort of analyse or just do a couple of variants but when you're doing species that um, have no information out there it's, it's quite computationally intensive and um, and can be quite difficult as uh, one of our researchers found out and I'll talk you through her case study. So what we kind of hope uh, will be an outcome from this Pathfinder thing is that uh, researchers uh, undertaking this type of assembly will be able to utilise uh, tools and or pipelines that have been developed, deployed on the BioCloud um, and that the operators of the BioCloud will better understand the usage patterns and the um, computational requirements of the infrastructure that should be provided uh, for the community. Um, so this next slide, um, I've had permission from uh, Dr. Carolyn Hogg um, to present this. this. She presented this at um, the Sydney Uni Informatics uh, Genomics Day and I think it's just a nice example of um, She's one of the people working on some of these 50 and 5 uh, genomes and she was, you know, had a whole series of animals that, you know, assembled nicely. Uh, but as soon as she got to the bilby, um, he was um, challenging. And so she kind of tried to run this um, on the Uni Sydney machine and failed. She tried to run it on NCI and failed. I think she tried it on Pawsey and it didn't work either and ended up working with um, putting out a call to the um, commercial providers um, and the Azure team kind of worked with her for a fee but um, were able to get that um, Bilby genome assembled uh, for basically uh, $1,100. Um, the final one was her saying this is a lot of my time <laughs> to try and get it run across things and I'm very tempted just to put a box under my desk which in this day and age would be extremely frustrating to the whole community. 
Um, so essentially what we have is a workforce in transition um, and also an infrastructure opportunity uh, for I imagine the people in this room. Um, so the workforce is transitioning so there'll be lots of lots less field work or wet lab stuff and a lot more dry lab stuff. Uh, we're discovering there's a massive skills shortage uh, within the community. Um, there have been poor interactions with existing technology <coughs> providers. The domain itself is quite late to the HPC party um, and with the cloud first initiatives overseas might never really come fully to the HPC party. It might just leapfrog that into cloud but we'll see. Um, Often the software is kind of clunky and definitely not optimised to run on traditional HPC systems. The skills don't exist within the research community to rectify that at all. Um, and I guess we want to get to a stage where we're avoiding the frustration within the research community so we can avoid that box under the desk. And accelerate science. So the other implementation study that I thought might be of interest to this group is the BioCloud. Um, and how we're approaching that. I will tell you a bit about the intended outcomes and then hand over to Mark to talk to you about it a little bit more. Um, but essentially we're kind of looking at a Pathfinder BioCloud that's capable of supporting um, intense data intensive biology, um, upskilling the infrastructure providers and also looking at I guess the cost benefit of um, running it uh, on commercial and non-commercial cloud as well. So I might just hand over to Mark Gray who is the head of data at Pawsey um, to tell you a little bit about um, that implementation study because uh, Pawsey are leading one of the work packages. So Sarah's coming back, so don't get too excited. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm here to talk about a little bit about the BioCloud. So the um, bi one of the big um, blocks of work in the BioCommons is the creation of something called a BioCloud. Um, we're working on it. NCI are working on it. There's a few other organisations working on it as well. Arnet, um, AEF, I think, are involved, and and um, anyone is kind of anyone is kind of in there somewhere. So what are we trying to achieve? Uh, um, Sarah mentioned uh, Carolyn Hogg's problem and how she kind of at some point realised that she'd probably get better throughput by just putting up, buying a computer and putting it under her desk and getting to work. And it is a very uh, good short term solution if you never plan to use it for anything else and you definitely never have to scale any of your algorithm work and it'll definitely, you'll definitely never collect a lot more data in the future for instance, which seems to be all quite poor assumptions in the case of, say, you know, at scale genomics. So um, ultimately what we're trying to do is achieve a case where uh, researchers are no longer tempted to put boxes under desks where they can get good access to resource uh, without having to do that. Now what that actually looks like in practice is, um, is a combination of uh, leveraging commercial cloud uh, where it makes sense. Um, and also using the public HPC facilities when that makes sense. Uh, there's, there's actually issues in both cases. It's not as simple as saying one or the other. Commercial cloud's very attractive, you know, and there's some commercial cloud vendors here who will say it's a very, very good idea. Um, and it is very fast to get stuff running on commercial cloud. It also uh, requires you to have a budget for your work, your compute work as part of your project. And if you've got a budget allocation or a research grant that doesn't actually include a, a, bud a comp computational budget, it might be hard to find, you know, the actual exact, identify exactly how you're going to pay for that. Um, public HPC is cheap in the sense that it's, in Australia it's paid for by somebody else and we run it for free for researchers who want to use the facility. Um, the downside is that uh, our HPC facilities uh, have been created by and work well for computational physicists and computational chemists historically. And uh, bioinformaticians uh, find our facilities very hard to use. So um, there's a, there is actually, a, while it might be free in the uh, money sense, it's not free in the time sense. If you want to be actually get, scale, get your work running on HPC facilities, there's a significant cost that you would have to put into your work to make that happen. And, and right now we're making researchers take on all that cost. So that's, um, that's not really ideal. 
Uh, our involvement in the BioCommons is really around acknowledgement that we're trying to solve some problems that um, really are problems for us irrespective of what's happening in a larger sense in Australia nationally in respect to the solutions for BioCommons. Um, and so what are we trying to fix? Um, well, all problems, uh, really. Um, uh, bioinformatics, um, so I described, this is, so bioinformatics is the room, I apologise in advance, uh, but uh, my impression is that a lot of people go into biology because they hate computers. And, um, and so imagine the horror of doing that and then someone coming along and saying, well, it's nice that you want to study frogs and stuff, but um, you need to be a computational scientist now to get your work done. And you, maybe you need to be a computational scientist to graduate. And you didn't actually know that when you started. So that's a little bit awkward. Um, and, and hard, you know, computational uh, physics and chemistry, you know, we've got decades of experience under our belt of computational work. Uh, biology is trying to get it to the same level of maturity in a matter of years, and that's not very easy. So, um, so what we've got is a situation where there's lots of immature code, and we've got a, lot, a situation with lots of immature code, I think, partly because we've got this boxes under the desk solution to problems. If your staff starts on a, on a laptop and then you migrate it to a big box under your desk, um, you've got real no, no real incentive to figure out how to scale those algorithms because there's nothing to scale them to. Um, at least over in the commercial cloud and the public HPC side, there's a necessity to actually make your algorithm scale properly. And I, I, I'm of the opinion that if you get what work, if you get stuff working in one, it'll probably work reasonably well in the other, and you'll be able to access facility in a reasonable way. And it's about getting at, um, you know, the portability of code or portability of algorithms, being able to run things across centres without having to go to enormous lengths to make that work. Um, uh, bioinformatics, well, I mean, this is provenance of research is important in all fields, but in um, medical biology and other areas where, you know, people maybe require you to keep the data around for 20 years and your workflows around as well uh, for that data, uh, there's, a, there's a significant, um, I guess, mandate on research to be able to provide some evidence of reproducibility of their work. Um, there's, uh, you know, stuff around collaboration. Um, the, the software dependencies that all these algorithms come to us. Uh, physicists are great, chemists are great, they just want to run, uh, physicists, you know, climate scientists want to run WARF, you know, um, people want to run NAMD. Uh, the bioinformaticians come to us with, uh, you know, 20 algorithms just to get us from a bash script, um, and that's, that's kind of their workflow. Um, that, that makes their software dependencies and just their architecture required to get their work working uh, much more complex. Um, and then there's um, ease of use. So, um, uh, Sarah mentioned the 30,000 um, biologists that are going to be probably needing this kind of resource, our kind of resources, over the next five years. Um, uh, so, Palsy has a staff of uh, 48 people, I think, at the moment. So, um, if we uh, hired, uh, trained all our staff out to go and train bioinformaticians uh, over the next, say, five years, uh, and we did 20 people at a time, uh, let me do the math, no, we're not going to be able to train up all 30,000 of Australia's bio biologists in being able to run on our facilities. So the only way we're actually going to be able to um, provide facilities that researchers are going to be able to use is by making them easier to use. So that our training load is in fact ma manageable with the sa size of staff that we have. There's that just seems obvious. Um, and then there's, um, you know, there's actually this performance issues with, um, you know, uh, Python codes maybe not being very performant on some of our HPC facilities. And the, the one I tacked there at the end, data movement. So um, I mean, this is an issue for a lot of researchers, but it's also an issue if you're, you know, collaborating with DNA that, sh that needs, is sh collected. People don't, people who have cancer don't like being stabbed all the time. So um, once you've got DNA samples for people that are willing to be shared, well, you know, obviously you want to be able to uh, spare those across research teams, across institutions, and some of that stuff's still just not easy. So the BioCloud, uh, the components of this work that we're engaged with, uh, really across a few areas. I've underlined the software and containerization. There's a package there that we're working on um, and leading at Pawsey, and it's about 
really trying to get much better processes around the use of containers uh, in our facility and also getting some level of rigor around the management of the containers themselves to make them easy for use for researchers and make sure that the containers that they're using are actually going to be um, transportable across facilities. Why containers? Because uh, it's that, that thing we had with, you know, the guy with the, you know, 30 algorithms stitched together in a bash script. It just seems easier at the moment. That seems like the way to go. If someone else has something better, we'll use that. Um, the, there's other, um, th these, all these work, uh, there's a BioCloud specific package, which is just, uh, at the moment, it's us and NCI setting up a kind of um, <clears throat> a mini federated cloud for actually leveraging some of this BioCloud work. But the BioCloud, as a larger sense, really contains all these things. Uh, because they're all kind of integrated. Um, the data movement one, um, there, there are still lots of issues. Moving data around between facilities, uh, moving data around within universities, from universities to universities and universities to our facilities. None of that is yet, um, there's just lots of friction points when you start to move stuff around. And this project is in the, in the prototype phase, uh, trying to <clears throat> at least understand what they are so that we can actually have some you know, co coordinated way of coming up with a solution uh, to those problems. And then there's leveraging commercial cloud for hybrid work. So uh, there's a lot of interest in commercial cloud from, uh, from researchers. There's researchers already using it uh, because it's just easy. And uh, if they have the money, why not? Um, I guess we don't want to really say to people, you only run with us and you don't run with somebody else. Um, I don't really want to help to pre um, prescribe to researchers where they want to run their stuff. Rather, I want our stuff to look superficially a little bit more like commercial cloud so that they can move their workflows backwards and forwards without you know, having to go through hoops. I'd rather have researchers um, understand that they can just run their stuff at Palsy or NCI or AWS. It just depends on you know, fundamentally where they get a better deal and a better host for their work. Um, yeah, so back to you, Sarah. I'm going to hang around here just looking at the back of the stage for questions. Um, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. You need three hands. There you go. Um, okay, so just to sum this talk up, uh, there were a couple of key challenges that have sort of that have emerged that I guess that we'll be looking at over the next um, five to ten years, and that is how do we use the infrastructure uh, locally to remain competitive in in this global research landscape? How do we keep up? with the global investments. I think that's almost how do we align with the global investments. Um, what do we as Australians specialise in and what can we bring to a global table? How do we deal with the distance internally and externally and how do we deal with issues of data movement? How do we keep and retain um, the best staff and, and researchers? And I guess, you know, what's Australia's place in the biosciences global research infrastructure context? So. <laughs> Sort of, I guess there's four take home messages from this talk, um, and that is that life sciences just hasn't had the same uh, interaction um, with the evolution of HPC as other domains have. Um, Biocommons is um, looking for partners, and there are multiple ways to engage, so if you're interested, just have a chat to myself or Andrew or Mark. <laughs> um, how can infrastructure providers support communities that aren't computational chemists and physicists? And that there are better opportunities, there, well, sorry, there are opportunities for better engagement between researchers and infrastructure providers, and we're really interested in exploring that. So that's it. Um, those are my contact details and Andrew Loney's, and um, I'm sure it's easy to get in contact with Mark. Yeah, pretty easy. Yeah, <laughs> he's right here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you. And any questions for either of us? Okay, can we have a yeah, first? Yeah.